All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this Saving Life on Earth webinar. I'm Tiara Curry. I'm a senior scientist in our Saving Life on Earth campaign. And we're excited to share this with you and to talk about the many ways that we're working to end extinction. We have a great panel tonight from our environmental health and population and sustainability programs. And I'm gonna hand it over to our speakers to introduce themselves. Jennifer, do you wanna go first? Yeah, hi, I'm Jennifer Molador. I'm the senior food campaigner here in the population and sustainability program. Then we have Hannah. Hi everybody, I'm Hannah Connor. I'm a senior attorney in the environmental health program coming to you from Florida. And Laurieann. I'm Laurieann Bird. I'm the environmental health director here at the center, coming in hot from Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> All right, thank you. So let's get started. Jennifer, let's start with you. Can you give us an overview of how the pandemic has impacted our food system? Yeah, so the pandemic really highlighted vulnerabilities in our food system and the environmental impacts and injustices in our food system that existed long before COVID, really put a spotlight on it. First, it really highlighted the size and power of the meat and dairy industry. Um, the four largest meat companies, for example, in the U.S. Own, control 85% of U.S. beef and almost the entire meat industry. Tyson Foods, one of those companies, owns 25% of all U.S. beef, and they have about $12.7 billion in sales for beef. And yet producers like this receive, receive the majority of the agricultural bailout funds in 2020, even as their profit margins were growing. Um, and at the same time, smaller, independent, marginalized farmers were still struggling. So really highlighting the power of the meat and dairy lobby in Washington. But it also highlighted some things behind the scenes that were going on before, um, including cruelty towards the workers in the meatpacking industry. So as the crisis worsened, for example, the Defense Protection Act was invoked, but not to make masks or medical equipment available for Americans and the workers in the meatpacking industry, but to produce meat and sell it to other countries. So <laughs> the federal government was sort of pressuring uh, meatpacking workers, an investigation revealed, to return to work in these really sort of dangerous um, conditions to export meat to other countries. And this is sort of business as usual to some degree for the meatpacking industry where workers are crammed in horrific conditions, working conditions, um, inhumane, unsafe, often not allowed even to go to the bathroom, they don't have access to food or personal protection gear. They don't have health insurance. They're constantly under threat of losing their jobs, their low wages. Many of these workers come from our already marginalized communities. Um, and so COVID just ripped through these essential workers kind of pressured into going back into work too soon in the meatpacking industry in these horrific conditions. And 50,000 meatpacking workers caught COVID leading to a community spread of 340,000 related cases and 18,000 meatpacking industry related deaths um, and enormous billions of dollars in economic damages. So already this is kind of one of the harshest jobs, most dangerous jobs with the least protections, just rife with abuse. And it really just, COVID just really shown a spotlight on that. And we are also learned about sort of the wildlife connections as well people on the planet, the link between um, the pandemic and wildlife, between the pressure we're putting on the planet, the deforestation and habitat loss that's you know, kind of creating these conditions in which pandemic spreads. And that brings us right back into the meat and dairy industry, which have a huge role to play in that. And then we also saw the rise of false solutions to these problems. And one of them, I think our other panelists are gonna speak about a little bit more is for example, the regenerative beef movement. And a false solution like this doesn't emphasize enough how much we need to scale down meat and dairy reduction in order to create a just, equitable food system. So we're going to be talking a little bit about false solutions to some of the problems that were highlighted from uh, the pandemic and that existed beforehand. So Hannah, for example, is going to talk a little bit more about the meatpacking industry and some of the cases the center is working on, how the connections between food systems for the people and the planet are connected. And Lorianne's going to do the same as well with farm workers and with wildlife as well. And just really talk a little bit more about the abuses and failures in the industry, how they're linked with environmental failures as well, and how we can create a more just and equitable food system. Thanks, Jennifer. That's like really terrible. I didn't know all of those statistics. That's pretty mortifying. 
Um, Loriana also heard that the requirements for protective equipment were weakened for farm workers during the pandemic. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, pretty crazy, huh? Um, early on in the pandemic, you know, Jennifer mentioned the Defense Production Act was invoked. It was not invoked to produce protective equipment, um, but because of that, there were people who already were using and needing protective equipment, including farm workers. Um, there are numerous pesticides where they need to be wearing masks, um, gowns, gloves, et cetera. And so EPA, rather than finding a national stockpile um, or pushing for policies that would protect these farm workers or saying these pesticides can't be used if you can't use them safely said, ah, I don't know, just go ahead and expose yourself to uh, some dangerous chemicals um, while, while fighting off this pandemic. And so that was, that was honestly pretty shocking that they issued that waiver for this incredibly vulnerable community, um, especially because many of these things are um, inhaled and we know that all air pollution increases um, risk of contracting COVID and severity of the disease. So that was bad. Um, a couple other things that I'll highlight briefly um, was that <clears throat> um, Antibiotics were approved for use on citrus um, in the midst of a global pandemic, which again was pretty shocking. Um, you know, medically important antibiotics that are essential for fighting diseases like tuberculosis, which is still a global pandemic, um, were approved for use in citrus crops, um, mm -hmm. Florida, California, places where there are these really labor intensive industries. Um, and despite warnings from CDC and others, um, you know, that the rise of antibiotic resistance infections is a major global threat, um, EPA went ahead with these approvals. Um, another thing, this was actually in January, so not 2020, but um, in January, one of the last things the Trump administration did was approve Aldicarb. Um, for use on citrus as well in Florida. And Aldicarb is banned in most of the world, was um, almost entirely banned in the US and is getting brought back despite the fact that it's incredibly dangerous, actually covered by international treaty because it's so dangerous, banned by international treaties. Um, so that also came back and that poses a huge threat to farm workers and their kids. It's um, especially dangerous for kids. Um, I think, you know, more broadly through all of these horrors, the plight of farm workers um, and meatpacking workers became much more widely known. Um, and there has been much more debate um, about how they're treated, um, their immigration status, you know, being classified as essential and therefore being exempt from all these, you know, rules that we had um, because they were so essential, but then being sent to their death in many instances, unfortunately, um, kind of elevated the profile of these issues. You know, these are people who in many instances have to be transported to fields or work sites together. So they weren't given the luxury of social distancing or all driving in their own cars. And you know, all these kinds of factors started to be looked at. And I think there's there's more robust debate and people talking about, you know, these people who worked through this pandemic and kept fresh food on our tables um, absolutely deserve a path to citizenship. There's so many issues we need to unpack here. Um, I want to turn it over to Hannah for a minute to talk about just has the meat industry exploited workers and communities during COVID? Thanks, Sierra. And Kind of one of the themes I think that we're hoping to cover here is, so I was watching an interview last night with Seth, My Seth Myers and John Oliver. And John Oliver, I think really succinctly was like, we learned so many things in the last year. I am concerned I'm immediately going to forget everything I learned as soon as I'm able to leave my house. And so one of the things that we're hoping to do here is talk about what happened, but also talk about you know, that this is not uh, an isolated situation within this industry. 
that there are some lessons learned here, learned here, not just kind of a thing that we can see as being tragic and move on. So kind of to start with, you know, the American meat industry has far before COVID exploited workers, um, especially vulnerable, undocumented, migrant, low wealth workers, and even incarcerated populations, some of which were obviously just discussed by Lorianne as well as use communities, often communities of color, black and brown communities and indigenous communities as dumping grounds for their extractive and pollutive practices, um, including through the slaughter operations themselves, through the factory farms that feed those slaughter operations, and then through the pesticide heavy row crop production that is used to create the feed for those factory farms. All of these things go hand in hand. And you could see through the long history of struggles for workers' rights, for community health, safety, transparency, and welfare, and against environmental injustice, that this industry has basically twisted itself so that those are its pillars. Those are going to be its legacy. And that is horrid. Um, you know, in terms of worker safety, for example, in, in 2017, three years before COVID was but a twinkle in our eye, the uh, US GAO, the Government Accountability Office, it's the government watchdog. It's part of the government, but it watchdogs itself. And it was reporting to Congress and it reported to Congress that meat and poultry slaughter and processing is one of the most hazardous industries in the United States. And that's been a message consistently for a very, very long time uh, before COVID and if things don't change after COVID. And our hope is that things do change uh, and that what has been learned will help to precipitate that change. So what we've seen through COVID is really just a symptom of that larger problem uh, and spotlighting of the gravity of these issues, both for you know, human and non-human animals, frankly, um, which we'll talk about some in one of my later questions, I think, um, while also calling into question you know, the stability, stability and sustainability of the system of production, which in essence is an attempt to mechanize and streamline like you produce a car, the production and slaughter of real life animals for food. Um, and that literally broke down early on in the pandemic because of this industry's dogged failure to recognize that human beings, in this case, the workers themselves who are subject to sickness and injury are the heart of these operations. Um, and that those workers live in community. So, for example, to the question kind of specifically asked, get away from the rambling that I'm doing right now, to the question specifically asked uh, and was discussed during our webinar, I, I think formerly, and that was mentioned by Jennifer, but I think is worth reiterating. In meat packing plants, because of the rate of slaughter and technical difficulty, workers also have to work, often have to work shoulder to shoulder to keep up with the demands of their jobs. And those demands are known for causing all sorts of pretty heinous injuries a carpal tunnel syndrome, ranging from you know neurological issues to lacerations to actually loss of limbs to loss of life. So it's a, a real huge range of issues that workers can face on a day-to-day -day basis um, in those jobs and to keep up with the demands of what the jobs require. And in the context of COVID, that combined with the corporate meat packers failure to take timely precautionary steps to protect workers presented the perfect storm during which kind of starting in March of last year. And it's interesting, I was reflecting on the fact that we are talking about something that literally was happening at this time last year. But starting in March of last year, meatpacking plants became COVID hotspots. And even then, rather than taking adequate action to pretend, protect this against the spread of disease, um, these industries lobbied the president and said, we want you to figure out a way that we can stay open without providing those protections. And they were successful because it's an extremely powerful industry with an extremely powerful lobby. And they got an executive order that declared a national emergency, uh, used the, the Defense Production Act to say that, quote, uh, beef, pork and poultry plants must continue operating to fulfill orders and ensure a continued supply of protein for Americans. First, what we saw, massive exports of meat thereafter. So the idea is a false premise that this was actually for Americans. Um, but also what we did see is that they, they didn't implement any additional protections for workers. 
And as a result, and this is also going to be a little bit of reiteration of what Jennifer said, but I think the gravity of it makes it worth reiterating. As of March this year, at least 88,000 meat processing and farm workers have tested positive for COVID, and at least 376 workers have died, uh, often in horrific ways, often without having been told what's going on. And these workers, again, lived in communities. So according to the study that, that Jennifer was, was referring to, and bears kind of a little bit more unpacking, within 150 days after emergence of COVID-19 in any given county, uh, the presence of large beef packing plants increased per, per, per capita infection rates by 110% relative to counties that didn't have those plants. Uh, for pork and chicken processing facilities, it was 160 and 20% respectively. So you have these pretty huge swaths of the community that ended up being affected because of the transmission of disease into those communities. And that resulted in the 334,000 COVID cases that have been connected to meat packing processes, um, which they have estimated to be approximately 100, 100, 1,000, cannot talk, $11.2 billion worth of drain on our economy through mobility and mortality. So, you know, this is a huge impact. That's another subsidy. That was us as American people trying to pay for what was going into communities and could have been prevented. Uh, and what these statistics really show are twofold. One, that the policies currently in place are failing to protect workers in slaughterhouses against the spread of infectious disease. Um, this is not the first time that's happened, it's just the most extreme. And that the policies in place are failing to, failing to show that the transmission of disease within these facilities only occurs within the four corners of those facilities. That in fact, it can go into communities, workers or people, they live in community. Um, and so you're talking about a holistic system that is, is really problematic and damaging. But what we really acutely saw were that the most reasonable protective measures, obviously we already said they weren't required by the EO, by the president, that they weren't voluntarily taken early on by this industry. They weren't voluntarily taken at any point. Uh, there are some like we gave masks that that is standardly what you hear back from these packers, but the most reasonable protective measures, things like slowing slaughter lines, actually separating people on the slaughter line, um, providing for testing, providing for paid leave for sick employees, those things tended not to be given. And in fact, we saw the opposite. What we saw was the speed up of slaughter line speeds. And what that means is that they sped up the number of animals that had to be or could be processed on that slaughter line uh, from kind of like a arguably doable, still not doable in any universe to higher speeds, which meant higher pressure on those workers that they you know, had to try to comply with, created more proximity issues, more possibility for transmission of disease and more possibility for injury. So in chicken slaughter plants in 2008, 2018, before COVID, uh, USDA started this waiver program that said poultry slaughter operations, you can waive into this program uh, and you can go above the standard 140 birds per minute slaughter capacity cap uh, and move it up to 175. They did not halt that program once COVID started. And in fact, in April alone, 15 operations got waivers 15 operations right before they got that executive order ordering meat facilities to be opened. Um, and studies have found that these plants taken together are 10 times more likely to have COVID-19 case, COVID cases than those without uh, line speed waivers. There is a similar but slightly different context within pig operations. I won't go too far into the weeds, but um, there was a rulemaking in, that concluded in 2019 during that rulemaking, the administration, USDA in this case, said uh, hog slaughter operations, you can move into this program and you can choose what your line speeds are. It was formerly a little over a thousand head per hour of hogs. You could choose what you want to do. That, those, there are obvious problems with that kind of restraint. But again, the movement of facilities into this program did not change during COVID. In fact, the most recent facility just converted a few weeks ago in Iowa. So we, you know, we're seeing these issues and, and essentially what this is is just a snapshot 
into the ways in which the meat industry exploits workers and puts communities at risk. And it's a pretty telling way kind of that speaks to how these fights for equity um, need to move, be moved forward to be able to get to a more just food system. Um, but unfortunately, at the end of the day, the answer to your question is dire. It was, it was really, really impactful and harmful. That is all incredibly bleak. Um, like with the spotlight on that, that COVID brought, did anything positive happen in this space? Yes, yes it did. <laughs> I could bring some positivity to this conversation in like a dark way, but positivity. So, you know, for the pig slaughter rule that we discussed in that last answer, there are actually three challenges to that pig slaughter rule. We are part of one of them, along with a number of animal welfare groups and farm sanctuaries, challenging that rule for kind of failure to consider impacts to animal welfare and environmental harm from passage of the rule in terms of line speed and in terms of the second aspect of the rule that dealt with um, moving federal inspectors off the line and replacing them and privatizing them with plant employees. So we challenged that rule. Food and Water Watch also challenged the rule on food safety and consumer safety and, and health grounds. And then, um, UFCW, which is the union that represents slaughter workers, also challenged the rule through public citizen. And just in March, very late in March, not that few, not many weeks ago, uh, the UFCW was successful in their lawsuit, which is a huge win. That success means that the court found that the line speed program, so the removal of those caps was uh, unlawful and needed to be vacated. Now, you know, that leaves us with some, some more direction to go. One is that that didn't change the inspector issues. Um, they still didn't review what the environmental implications of this rulemaking were. And the court granted the government uh, 90 days, I believe, to be able to wait until it would actually issue that order so the government can determine what it's going to do. So there are still some outliers there, but, you know, that is a huge win. And it, it's something that really should be recognize for what it is, which is moving forward and trying to dismantle this extremely problematic system. Um, in addition, at least for the poultry waiver program, we mentioned that earlier, the 15 poultry waivers that were granted in April, that produced a huge backlash and a huge uproar uh, that in some way the, the USDA actually heard, shockingly, and uh, they have not granted another waiver within that program since that date, since those 15 were issued. And they have said that they're not going to until COVID is over. Now, whether they do, they're gonna do it, that's a question, but they heard people, they heard the demand and they, they stopped granting those waivers. Now the waivers for the old ones remain in place, uh, but Cory Booker and a number of other legislators have introduced a uh, legislation twice now. It's called the Safe Line Speeds in COVID-19 Act. Our organization is an endorsing organization for that act. If it is passed, it will also roll back any waivers that have been granted during, during the further duration of COVID uh, to make sure that those line speeds go back to at most 140 birds per minute. So take off some of those stresses, take off some of those real problems for, for worker and transmission and disease. And kind of just the last one is um, in January, January 20th, as we all may remember very fondly, um, following efforts by the center and other, others, the Biden administration scrapped a pending Trump regulation that would have created a program to allow poultry plants to increase their line speeds outside of the waiver program. So create a system that was much more comparable to what was approved within the hog context. Um, the Biden administration, because if we had gone into rulemaking for that, it was gonna be a long struggle and it was gonna be a long injustice. Um, so there's definitely progress and, and things to celebrate, I think, on this front and represents a really good example of the power that we can wield if seemingly different kind of arms of the public interest, kind of in this case, we're talking about food safety, we're talking about worker safety, we're talking about unions, we're talking about animal welfare, we're talking about conservation groups come together to find that shared future 
and the ways that we can advocate together and advocate for you know, really beneficial ways to move us forward. And I think that those examples show that that type of power can be super successful. Thanks, Hannah. Can you also talk to us about some of the other ways that COVID spotlighted how meat production harms the environment? Yes, I can. And I've been talking for a long time. So I am very sorry that's okay. to everyone that's okay. for that. <laughs> um, You're the so expert. So I, I will just focus on one thing and not try to take us down any rabbit holes. Um, but it's one thing that I think is extremely demonstrative of the insecurities uh, that the last year laid bare and that illustrated the fragility of the economic consolidation and vertical integration system of meat production in this country. And a system kind of just as like an upper level, a system in which major meat packing corporations, some are foreign, some are domestic, own the slaughterhouses. They own the distribution systems. They own the animals that go into the factory farms, but they just, they don't raise, they it, by and large don't raise them. They contract out the raising of those animals in the factory farms to growers in kind of world renowned exploitive contracts. There have been lots of efforts to try to create some justice even within the contract system to the ex extent that those contracts have been referred to as modern day indentured servitude. And that will come into play, I promise, but the background seems important to me. Um, so for us, we're gonna focus on the collateral effect of what happened when one piece of this hugely consolidated system, in that case, the slaughterhouses we were just talking about, breakdown. Uh, as Jennifer said, you know, four, meat, four beef packing firms control 85% of beef in the United States. JBS, Tyson Foods, National Beef Packing, and um, Cargill. Uh, and then two, two of which were both on that list, control 40% of the poultry product. That is JBS, who owns Pilgrim's Pride and Tyson's Food. And then again, two of those are on the list of four that control nearly 70% of pork mar the pork market. So you have Smithfield, again, Tyson Foods, Cargill, and uh, JBS. Again, they own something called Swift and Company. So a lot of times you have the same corporations, perhaps under their different subsidiaries, um, but they have cornered the market with very, only a very handful of them at the helm. As a result of this bottleneck, of corporate control, when the meatpacking plants started to shut down and have volume management issues during, due to worker illness and other problems during COVID, their slaughter activities likewise needed to be reduced. And, and what does that mean? That means that the farm animals that they had crack, contracted to be grown for slaughter got stuck in limbo. Those, those animals had nowhere to go and it's a significant number of animals. And that, of course, you know, speaks volumes about the long-term sustainability of this industry as it's been currently constructed, uh, where this highly consolidated model is showing itself to, in fact, be less resilient than regional diversified systems of independent producers uh, and independent slaughterhouses that can accept the ebb and flow of service. Um, but what we're going to talk about, and maybe Jennifer would like to touch on that in some of her remarks, um, because she is extremely good at kind of articulating those issues. But we're, what we're gonna talk about is the fate of those millions of farm animals. Um, indeed, according to the chairman of Tyson Food who took out a full page ad in the New York Times and other outlets, the closures, he said very dramatically, were expected to lead to millions of animals, chickens, pigs, cattle, being depopulated, which is killed and their carcasses disposed of. Uh, because of closure of the processing facilities. And unfortunately, that, that is what happened. Millions of animals were depopulated and disposed across the South and West. Uh, as the industry has explained, holding animals on facilities until slaughter capacity resumed was unsatisfactory because animals may outgrow slaughter equipment. The slaughter equipment is usually made for certain basically cogs of animals to go through. If you get bigger, you don't fit. Um, and because under the integrated system of production, the new generation of farm animals had already been bred and was waiting to take the existing place of the former generation that was supposed to go to slaughter, leading to capacity and space issues. 
uh, further, if you say, it, could they go to other markets? Besides the fact that the corporate growers have taken, corporate corporations have taken over most of the independent meatpacking plants, so you often don't have that kind of access in the market anymore, they weren't able to absorb the number of animals that we're talking about. And of course, they didn't look to farm sanctuaries. Um, and I want to put a plug in for everybody to support your local farm sanctuary. Extremely important. Um, but what the co companies resorted to doing was killing the animals, which you know, obviously has its own moral issues. Um, we're not gonna talk about those, but, the envi but environmentally speaking, it also is accompanied by a number of logistical issues of how to dispose of that number of animals in a geographic area and uh, whether there is any go uh, government oversight of the way that they do it. Um, and to be clear, and again, back to that theme, this is not the first time this type of question has arisen. When factory farmed animals are depopulated, it's an industry term, it's very gushy. Um, it's hard to say, you know, murdered over and over again. Depopulated because of the spread of zoonotic diseases such as highly pathogenic avian influenza, H1N1, the swine flu, um, or other after natural disasters such as huge hurricanes or floods where animals left in confinement built facilities can drown or suffocate or otherwise die those also lead to mass mortalities that have to be disposed of. Um, so looking at the environmental implications of these mass mortalities, the question becomes, how do you do it? How do you, how do you dispose of this many animals um, after you know, wasting all of this life? And you know, sometimes these are very big animals. As we were talking about, they outgrow their ability to be slaughtered. Obviously they are not tiny. And so some of the options that are currently allowed by the government include things like mass on-site incineration. Uh, they include mass burial in unlined pits. When you're talking about a natural disaster where you already have swollen water tables, you know, you can, it doesn't really take a, a genius to be able to describe that that is gonna be extremely environmentally problematic and problematic for community health. Uh, so we set to work, uh, we recognized the issue, we recognized it for what it was. First, we, along with NRDC, Earth Justice, and a number of conservation, public health, and environmental justice groups filed an emergency position with USDA, their APHIS arm, requesting that the agency prohibit the use of these really problematic practices, online burial, uh, on-site on incineration, ask that the government create a publicly accessible database of where and how animals are depopulated so that people can protect themselves and have that type of information and ask for a longer standing rulemaking to go into place so that these types of provisions would not be considered just emergency events around COVID, but could be able, be able to be put into place you know, when we have these other really tragic events that take place. Um, then we filed a complementary one. This one was again with ALDF, uh, in this case also a number of farm sanctuaries and animal welfare groups. Those animals also, they have to be killed uh, and that petition looks specifically at the most cruel practices that are used for killing those animals, uh, in particular ventilator shutdown, which suffocates the animals often over a very long period of time or foam based suffocation and said that those things need to be discontinued, they need to be banned and additional regulations need to be put into place to stop this from happening again in the future. Um, and we also had another one, I'm not going to like take you guys down the road of like petitions because I know they're very boring, but just one other one was an emergency petition to FDA to discontinue their approval of ractopamine, which is a really gnarly drug that has been approved for growth promotion and it makes animals big and it makes them mean and it causes all sorts of neurological problems for them, um, ask that that be discontinued. Unfortunately, the federal government did not respond very quickly to these petitions. They have not fully responded to any of these petitions, but all of them are forward looking. All of them look to see that we try to address what's going on right now, but that we also are able to address this so the communities and the environment do not need to suffer this again in the future. Uh, and so we're gonna keep that you know, hard headed approach going on and are hopeful in this new administration that we may be able to find some ears, hearts, and minds that are willing to actually work with us and work with us to make sure that there is, you know, a better legacy for these for these issues. 
um, and to address you know, the underlying fragility of this huge consolidation debacle and what it means in terms of a future for this food, food for our food system. And that is so much injustice to address. That is all very horrific. Um, well, thank you for that. I wanna go back over to Jennifer to just talk about the other ways that food justice and environmental justice were highlighted, the connection between them in the, in the pandemic. Yeah, thanks Tara. So thinking about community agriculture versus large scale infrastructure, you know, Hannah just talked about the slaughter breakdown. That's a really vivid graphic way to think about this, about wasting all those lives and all the environmental resources that went into producing them and growing them. Um, it just really demonstrates that one break in the food chain, like the pandemic will present, can shut the system down. You may have also read about the massive food waste uh, that was not uh, necessarily pork and cows and so on, but potatoes or seafood. Um, because when the food systems are so massive like this, a break in the chain is going to break distribution and it's going to break the supply chain too. So on one hand, community-based agriculture, diversified regional agriculture, as Hannah mentioned, um, is going to be really a key answer here in a lot of ways. Since a shorter supply chain is going to be less vulnerable to these kinds of breakdowns, it's going to be more likely to adapt and shift gears when needed and really focus on the community at hand. Um, but at the same time, on the other hand, Geography alone or like a local food system alone isn't going to solve the problem. I mean, we still need to eat less meat and dairy overall. And we really need to also be honest and talk about the impact that meat and dairy production can have on local communities. And Hannah gave that example of this new report that essentially is saying if there's going to be a beef packing or pork pack packing plant or even um, poultry, you know, your chance of getting COVID, for example, is going to increase 110 to 160 percent. So it just it just highlights the fact that we already know living near factory farms or even industrial feed crop production, you're more likely to get sick. There's going to be more environmental impacts. There's going to be more toxins in the water and soil. And guess what? Black, indigenous, Latino communities are more likely to be impacted by these toxic food production practices. Simultaneously, these communities are also more likely to lack access to fresh fruit and healthy vegetables and you know, sustainable food production. So this is also true in rural areas. This is true in urban areas. And it's true for school children, for example. Um, a California report, California is where I am right now. I just studied school meals and 96%, 96% of school meals in California are meat-based, have some meat in them. So that's a state where we produce a third of the vegetables in the entire country, two thirds of the fruits and nuts in the entire country, and yet, these children are lacking access to healthy, sustainable food, 30 million children across the country. And for many of them, it's their only source of nutrition. And for many of them, um, they're from marginalized communities as well. So this is creating a food apartheid system, which we can go into more um, another time or in the question and answer. But, you know, children often are in these systems where maybe they are not getting healthy, sustainable food at school, or the nearest grocery store for their family is hours away, or they have a food mart near them, but it lacks healthy, fresh, sustainable food. So, you know, that's unfortunate. It's not a just food system, but I think we really also have been looking at how ignoring the health needs of children, particularly children of color, is actually built into the system so that the food system is built on white supremacy, where dairy, for example, is one of the most wasted food items in the school food system, right? It takes enormous amount of environmental resources to produce dairy. It's highly wasted. And it's also served, for example, to African-American children who are more likely to be lactose intolerant. So this food system just doesn't make sense. And it's certainly not just. Um, this also comes with all the resources that are wasted going into the food system. The impacts are connected to vulnerable species, bees, butterflies, pollinators, bears, wolves, and so on, and it harms our waterways, our habitats, ecosystems. So it just becomes really clear that the more just a food system is, the better it's for the environment and vice versa and goes back and forth. So it is obvious that to create a more just food system, major agricultural reforms are needed. Um, Lorian, can you tell us about the major reforms that the center is pushing for? Yeah, um, so one thing that we've been working on for a long time is um, fighting tooth and nail 
to get the EPA to um, comply with the law and consider endangered species impacts when it um, approves pesticides. And EPA has steadfastly ignored the law for decades on this. And this is really significant because endangered species are the canaries in the coal mines. So you know, there are about 1,800 plants and animals that are listed as um, endangered or threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and there are probably tens of thousands more that should be. Um, but when we protect the listed species, we protect everyone. Um, and so putting in place things like common sense buffers, limitations on spray time, limitations on height that spraying can happen, that's good for everyone. And so that's something that we continue to push and fight on. It's a longstanding campaign. Uh, we're making slow but incremental progress and hoping, um, hoping every day that it will get better. Um, another thing is that we've been um, challenging the registration of new really bad pesticides. Um, I mentioned aldicarb earlier, um, just got uh, approved for use on citrus trees in Florida and some antibiotics as well. EPA kind of operates under this premise that everything new is better and safer. And that's just not the case. It's just they don't have real world data on why it's more dangerous because it's only been tested on labs. That's what's new. So, um, you know, challenging those underlying presumptions and trying to ensure that new dangerous products aren't uh, just brought on market willy nilly. Another thing we've been looking at uh, the past couple of years, and this is a sneak preview, this is not public yet, so uh, I'd ask all 188 of you to keep this quiet, <laughs> is that we are soon to publish a paper on soil health and the role that pesticides play in soil health um, and pushing for reform policy reforms to ensure that we're protecting our soils um, from the myriad ways that they can be harmed. Um, and another thing that we've started working on in a more concerted way is um, pesticide use on public lands. There's an enormous amount of pesticide use on our federal public lands. Um, about 360,000 pounds used each year on our national wildlife refuges. Uh, pesticides, insecticides are sprayed widely across Western rangelands to protect habitat um, for cows. They don't want um, grasshoppers or Mormon crickets to eat the grass that uh, they want ranchers to be able to have their cows eat. And there's significant environmental justice concerns there, um, especially for you know communities living closer to the land or who have usual or custom uses of the land that are not expecting um, to encounter significant chemical exposure in those contexts and no consideration given of those um, communities also in forestry. Um, so those are, you know, some of the things we're fighting, um, fights coming up and things that we're looking, um, looking ahead to. I think there's gonna be a lot of discussion about regenerative ag. Um, it is the hot, sexy thing. This administration, you know, is sort of, latched onto it. Um, so have most major agricultural corporations. Um, this presents a massive greenwashing opportunity. Um, just recently, uh, we had a comment period with EPA on atrazine and all these people were talking about how they just can't grow sustainably without atrazine. Um, and so, you know, the industry is very much in line on their talking points about trying to keep business as usual and call it regenerative agriculture. And our worst fear, of course, is that you know this administration will build an infrastructure where carbon credits are given to people doing business as usual and calling it regenerative agriculture. So putting some parameters and guardrails around what that means is going to be a big deal, especially as you know if carbon markets open up um, on this issue in a more in a broader way. Um, and then biogas uh, is a perennial issue and the desire to take um, methane from, uh, what's the technical term, poop lagoons um, <laughs> and turn it into fuel um, and then call it sustainable. Um, 
and use that to promote um, factory farming and further subsidize this industry is, is a big threat. And that's something that we're gonna have to keep an eye on and continue fighting um, and make sure that that's not billed as a solution to our climate woes. So there's no shortage of reform that is needed and you guys have highlighted some major issues um, Jennifer, I'm going to turn to you for this one. What can our members and supporters do to help? This feels very overwhelming. So how can people help? Um, people can eat less meat and dairy and support policy that makes it possible for everyone to be able to eat less meat and dairy. If you want to protect wolves, eat less beef. That's the first, first way to start and switch from beef to something else, not chicken or pork. Or, um, support local efforts to shift subsidies, move money around um, to support increased access to healthy food in schools and in cities. Um, ask your, your mayor and your food council to push for food emissions targets in, your, in the city climate action plans. Um, listen to Black, Indigenous, and Latino food activists. Support BIPOC-owned businesses. Um, support reparations for farmers of color. Uh, encourage conservation organizations to model the work the center does to work with indigenous tribes, um, not against them in, in land um, opportunities. And uh, encourage everybody else to eat less meat and dairy if possible. If you're gonna eat meat and dairy, um, you know, uh, ask your producer to uh, in, impose like non-lethal wildlife management, um, but you still have to eat less meat and dairy. It's just the way that our planet is gonna to move towards this healthy, sustainable, just food system. And the more positive experiences that people have with plant-based foods, for example, and, and shifting towards sustainable diets, the better. And if you have any questions, you can write to me at earthfriendlydiet at biologicaldiversity.org. And I'm happy to answer any questions and, and help move us towards a, a better food system. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I want to take questions from the audience now. Let's start with Congress. Are there people in Congress who are working on these issues? Who wants to go first? Anna. <laughs> well, I will say that um, there has been a really good ally around these issues with Cory Booker, uh, probably unsurprisingly to most people. Uh, with the Safe Line Speeds Act, he sponsored that. He has sponsored legislation that deals with uh, reforming all of the discriminatory practices in USDA about black farmers. Um, and as Jennifer said, bringing back reparations to black farmers, the history there is deep and darker. We don't have time for it, but if anybody wants to talk about it, email me. Um, and Elizabeth Warren, especially on antibiotics issues has been a really good partner uh, as has Jackie Spear in California. Um, but I know that there's a whole other list if other folks would like to speak to them. In particular in pesticides, we, we have some overlap between pesticides and animal issue, animal kind of like animal ag issues, but you know, they, sometimes there are, are different parties. Um, I'll give a shout out to Rep Nagoose, who's been a steadfast champion um, of some legislation we have to reform our pesticide law, um, Protect America's Children from Toxic Pesticides Act, PACTPA. Um, and that includes all kinds of reforms, some technical stuff, some justice oriented stuff, um, some farm worker oriented work, uh, children's health, all of it's in there. And um, it has a, a nice broad suite of endorsers. Um, but yeah, Jennifer, anyone you wanna call out? Anyone particularly really depends on the issue, but just if there's an issue that you're passionate about, you know, you could reach out to us and, and we're tracking the, the people in the that are, we can work with and, and help you make connections as well. Thank you. Jennifer, this question is probably for you. Would buying from local farms help with the inequality in the meatpacking industry and would it be better for the workers? That's a complicated question. Um, overall, I'm just going to go back to the fact that we need to reduce uh, meat and dairy consumption overall. Supporting local producers can help, but if you are engaged with, you know, the practices they have, do they have non-legal predator control, for example? Um, how, you know, being local doesn't necessarily mean they're treating their workers better. So, you know, if you want to participate in community-supported agriculture, there's plenty of 
you know, plant-based farmers or primarily plant-based farmers that are doing these practices as well. Um, local, as we talked about, can help, and, but it's just, not, it's just not the only solution uh, by far. But if you want to help support community-based agriculture and urban garden movements, for example, there's a lot of great um, community garden movements and they're often led by BIPOC communities and they need more support from the government and from us and we need to get them connected and funded and, and subsidized. Thank you. Um, there's a question about antibiotic resistance. Are there any studies showing that workers and consumers exposed to antibiotics in meat and agriculture is contributing to antibiotic resistance? I'll take that one. Yes, um, there are a lot of studies out there. Actually, a lot of the studies that talk about antibiotics resistance kind of in the agricultural space are related to animal agriculture. Animal agriculture uses a significant amount of antibiotics in this country uh, and it has continued to do so. Those numbers have fluctuated some. It used to be used for growth promotion purposes. They've moved some beyond that. But the studies kind of overwhelmingly show that these uses and abuses do lead to antibiotic resistance. Um, they have a lot that talk about how you can get antibiotics resistant in a number of different ways. Some even as far as the bacteria being carried by insects off of facilities and going into communities. So there, there is a lot out there. In terms of crop practices, there are also links and concerns about expansion of antibiotics resistance as because of the use in this way. Um, we've done a number of FOIAs to try to find out, because it's obviously an underlying issue is, is, you know, what does it mean in terms of implication for antibiotics resistance beyond what does it mean for implications in terms of exposure to the antibiotics themselves. And CDC has said that they are concerned that it is going to be able to proliferate antibiotics resistance and does create that risk and threat. Um, so kind of across the board, these uses are um, A, an unnecessary when they're for cropping practices being used in a way that isn't actually shown to be actually that productive or in any way productive in addressing the um, crop issue that they, they're allegedly trying to address. And in animal agriculture, if they're just using them pro prophylactically. So dosing full herds versus, versus dosing you know, sick animals. Um, and again, this becomes part and parcel of the factory farming model. You get sick animals when you put animals on top of each other in a way that they can't move and that they can't express themselves. Uh, and it, it just breeds and festers disease. So those two things need to be separated and we need to move away from that system of production, then also move away from uh, excessive uses of antibiotics. Um, but yes, at the end of the day, the answer is yes, there is a lot out there. Um, and there's a lot out there that's pretty readily accessible, um, I think, through different resources on the internet. The Center for Food Safety, I'm sorry, um, the Johns Hopkins Center for Livable Future has done a lot of research in this space, and I would highly suggest take, taking a look at their page. Thanks, Hannah. So I love this question. What can students do to create a more fair and equal food system? How can students help make a difference? This one's probably for Jennifer. I'm going to kick it back to you, Jennifer. Yeah, um, I'm working with a really cool group of students right now who are doing a food project on community-based agriculture and community garden spaces and, to, you know, really looking at how community land, city land is transformed for community gardens and how this can help to address um, access and justice issues. And so there's so many things that students can do. They can do research projects like this. Um, they can reach out to their local representatives, whether they're city or county or state or so on. Um, and like I said, ask them, say, you know, you're creating these climate plans. We need to reduce our emissions. How about you reduce food emissions? How about you set targets for that? How about you work with procurement goals so that we are pro procuring less meat and dairy, for example? Um, there are a number of campus programs and um, student clubs, for example, that can work on these initiatives. And often people are more likely to listen to students to some degree than they are um, 
nonprofits sometimes so they can get their foot in the door that way. But there's a lot of opportunities to get involved and they can advocate for plant-based meals on campus, for example. Changing dining hall policy can make a big difference just on that one campus that can serve as a model campus and then other campuses can do it and so on. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, the, the US dietary guidelines, if we all followed those guidelines, um, we would produce four times more carbon than the, in, the dietary guidelines out of India. And so these things like, you know, they sound wonky, they sound small, but it's actually a really big difference that they can make. Thanks, Laurie. Um, three minutes is not gonna be long enough for you all to address this question. I already know that, but there's a question about the carbon footprint of grass-fed beef and regenerative agriculture, so. I will say that we're planning to do a webinar series on this very topic, so stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> we'll follow up on it for that, but it, I think we, we love to talk about this topic because as Lorianne said, there's a lot of greenwashing in this area. There's a lot of opportunity for improvement too. So the footprint comes along with, for example, land use. We're all often looking at carbon, but there's another environmental footprint besides just carbon, but the land use is often left out of that equation when they're talking about that. And so it, can, it gets more complex and, you know, as Lorianne wants to chime in there. Sure. Um, you know, grass fed can mean a million things. It can mean cows on a lush verdant field um, somewhere that gets a lot of rain. It can mean one cow requiring 400 acres somewhere really arid out west. And so, you know, you it's really hard to compare apples to apples. And I think if you go to some of the farms that have been really well studied um, in the context of regenerative ag, you might find that it's hard to move around because there's so many film crews documenting the wonderful things that they're doing. But what they're not documenting is the industry as a whole. And there are so many variables. Like right now, um, there are places on the coast in California where native elk are thirsting to death so that this, um, you know, eco, grass-fed beef can be raised and these native elk that are quite rare are fenced out of their own habitat in a national park um, so that these cows can be raised. And so, you know, there's, there's a really wide spectrum of practices, you know, whole packs of wolves are gunned down to protect um, grass-fed cows. And so, you know, when you, when you say grass-fed is better, um, it, it, it can just mean so very many things. So, you know, if you know someone who's doing things really right, that's great. And there are undoubtedly people who are doing interesting, cool things. Um, but the industry as a whole has a lot of problems and drives a lot of killing of wildlife, a lot of land conversion, a lot of dewatering Western streams, a lot of, um, a lot of species um, are heading towards extinction because of these grass-fed operations. So it sounds like we need- also, Sorry, I would just add also that reducing production is gonna help even these producers, the ones that are actually trying to do better practices. So it really helps those producers as well as the whole planet. It, it just brings us back to we need to eat less meat and dairy. Sounds like we need to do a whole webinar about that, but unfortunately we're out of time for tonight. Thank you to you at home for joining us and to Naaman Griselda and our digital team who are behind the scenes making this happen. Next week on Earth Day, we have a special webinar with the Thoreau Society. We're gonna talk about resistance and extinction. And then on the 29th, we have a film screening of our Gorongosa about wildlife conservation and women's empowerment in Mozambique. The video of tonight's webinar will post on our events page tomorrow go to action, then click on events. And then there's a link there to all of the previous Saving Life on Earth webinars. And as always, we're so grateful for your support to help us end extinction and save life on Earth. We really couldn't do this without you. And we're grateful to you for taking the time to join us this evening. So thank you and thanks to our panelists.